uh, thank you all for being here. Um, our panel here is, uh, we got a, a, a little bit of mix from uh, the three parts of the world that uh, sort of know where, uh, who has what dirt under their fingernails in the world of uh, politics and uh, local government. Uh, Brian Fritz is campaign manager for Melinda Katz. She is uh, the presumed uh, next borough president of Queens. She won the Democratic primary and she doesn't have an opponent, so she will probably be. Technically, we do. Yeah, yeah. No? Wow, I'm sorry. I should, <laughs> <laughs> I should put it that way. Yeah, she does have an opponent. Not a Republican opponent, so not a well heeled party back. Uh, 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 Errol Lewis, you probably all know from New York One. He's uh, been around forever. He's a uh, news anchor, City Hall. Uh, Former City Hall reporter? Never, never did it. Never did it. Oh. A columnist. Never did what? Never was. A, never really did any work. Never did right. <laughs> <laughs> He's a broadcaster. Okay. And Bob Liff on the right, one city hall reporter for Newsday, back when uh, dinosaurs roamed the earth. And uh, <laughs> uh, Bob had to uh, had this nasty habit of uh, getting married, and having kids, and having to support them. And he went into public relations. That's not totally true. I got that. That's not totally true. I got laid off, but that sounds much nicer. <laughs> By the serial no, the serial killer killed New York Newsday. I then went to the Daily News and got laid off six years later. Okay. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is uh, Robert and I have a series of questions. We're going to uh, take turns. It's good. You missed the intro. Here's my first intro. Okay, there you go. Did I know? Were you not here? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and Professor Harper from Political Science and I are going to just uh, alternate questions and then uh, give it up to you guys if you have any questions. Okay, if you want to jump in at any point, raise your hand. Uh, if you're big boys, they can take it. So, uh, let them have it. Okay. So, my first question to you guys, and order it and answer it any order you like. Uh, that mic doesn't have to move, it, it'll pick up whatever you say. Um, last mayoral election, we had less than 30% voter turnout. Um, do we even call this a democracy anymore, and why isn't that a bigger story? Well, I'll start. First of all, Errol was a columnist, and um, I, one of the great joys of my journalism career is I got to work with a guy named uh, Murray Kempton, who if you ever get a chance to read, go back in history, he was one of the great columnists. And Murray described the columnist as the guy who comes down from the hills after the battle is over and shoots the wounded. <laughs> um, um, you know, there are a lot of countries that have mandatory voting, and very few of those countries are countries you would consider to be democracies. I mean, it's like, um, um, we want you to vote, you know, you must vote, and, and, and the, of course the second part is you must vote for this guy. Um, you can't force anybody to vote, um, I think it's pretty depressing. Um, uh, you know, it's, um, I think people vote, I mean, you saw uh, in, the, in the Obama elections where you saw a massive turnout, particularly of communities of color, people who don't traditionally uh, vote in as large numbers. You've also seen a significant reaction across large parts of the country who don't like the fact that these damn people came out to vote and they've come up with a whole variety of means. This is kind of shocking for those of us old enough to remember the Civil Rights era and the Voting Rights Act, that there's now actually a counterattack on the right to vote and of course much of the country. But that's not what's going on here. And you have to distinguish between very high profile elections, mayoral elections, uh, presidential elections, to some degree gubernatorial elections and Senate elections. But, you know, we're, Albany only controls our lives, but, you know, it's like during the, during the Sandinista revolution, which has become for some bizarre reason an issue in this campaign, uh, they used to say that Americans will do anything for Central America except read about it. That's the same thing that goes on with Albany. We're totally controlled by Albany, but nobody down here pays much attention to it. So I think people have to be motivated to vote. Um, I think there should have been a higher turnout in this election, you know, but you also have Nobody was a giant. You know, you have Michael Bloomberg having been, you know, you know, having, having bought election three times is uh, kind of a stride this city. And um, uh, nobody, you had, you know, you had a, you had a passion gap. And um, so I think it's depressing, but you play the cards you dealt. I don't know, I don't know. I, don't, I, don't know yeah, I, don't, I have to say, I don't, I, I'm not as gloom and doom as others are 
about the, uh, the voter turnout numbers um, for two reasons. One is that there is such a thing as silence is assent. In other words, just because I don't go to my community board meetings, and I never do because I work at night and they always have the meetings at night, that doesn't mean I hate the community board or I don't believe in the community board or I, I don't read their emails or I don't participate. Well, I participate in a different way. I send them notes, I stop by the, the annual fair once a year or something like that, but that's just what I do. And so I wouldn't read too much into it. If people are reasonably satisfied that the ship of state is on course, that maybe they don't want to screw it up. Maybe they haven't bothered to inform themselves. Maybe they were out of the country for six months out of the year. There's a million reasons that people don't vote. And until we know that, I wouldn't be too, too upset about it. Now, you could do some survey research, and if you find out people are saying in large numbers, I hate the system, I don't believe in it, I don't like the candidates, and that's why I don't vote. Well, that's sort of a different question, but I, I don't know that that's really what's going on. The other reason that I'm not too, too upset about it is there are lots of other different ways to participate. And voting, you know, this was what they said at Occupy Wall Street over and over again. Voting is just one way to influence the government. There are demonstrations. There's writing to your member of Congress. There's, there's lots of different ways. You know, maybe you want to be local in a way that doesn't involve party organizations. Maybe you just want to work on your block association. Maybe you want to do service. Maybe that's your, your way to make the city better, make the country better, is to go out and you know, hand out food every weekend. So people do participate. And this is a country where there's a very, very high, I mean, they've been writing about this since the 19th century. Uh, you know, foreigners come here and they say, this is extraordinary, the amount of voluntary organizations. Uh, you know, the Red Cross and the blood bank and the civic groups and the churches, the houses of worship. There's all of this stuff that people do. And I think that counts. You know, I, I mean, you know, if people want to vote with their feet and not in the voting booth, in a, in a you know in a one-time winner-take-all situation involving, you know, and filtered through party organizations in which a lot of people don't have a lot of confidence, I, I couldn't blame them. You know, I mean, I'm a member of the Democratic Party. I've been a member of the Democratic well, member. I've been a I've been a registered Democrat for like 30 years. I've never gotten a membership card. I've never been told, you know, here are our principles. You know, I get some candidates who will ask me for money, or the party will ask me for money. That's only because my wife gave them money, and then you can never get rid of those people, you know? <laughs> so, so, you know, which, which, by the way, is another way that you can contribute. Maybe you don't want to show up and vote. Maybe you've realized that the better way to sort of uh, make something happen is to figure out the part of politics that close, most closely aligns with you and give some money or some time or something else to that group. So. You know, yeah, it, it would be nice if, if a lot of if a lot more people voted, but I don't, I'm not sure that that's where the action is. Yeah, I agree with a lot of that. I I think the most recent election uh, turnout numbers are those are pretty typical numbers for an election where it's only municipal elections, or it's only city stuff. Um, you know, each each city runs their uh, elections a little differently, and each state does it differently as well. I mean, in New York, we have a closed primary system where only Democrats are allowed, allowed to vote in the Democratic primary. Um, if you're not affiliated with a party, you can't take part in that process. That's one, one way that certain states get higher primary numbers is by allowing everyone to vote in the primaries that they choose open to vote primaries. in. Open primaries. Yeah, open primaries. Um, so, you know, and another way we could change, if, if greater turnout was our goal, we could combine the municipal election with you know, federal primaries or with the state primaries. It doesn't have to be municipal by itself. That's just the way New York chooses to do things. Um, but I, I agree with a lot of what Al said. There's so many ways that you can be involved in what's going on in your community. I think voting is very important. Um, I think everyone should vote. Um, but it doesn't have to be the only way that you get involved. And I really hope that it isn't the only way. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I, I don't think the, well, I, I didn't find the, the turnout number surprising considering the type of elections that we have here in New York City. Um, but yeah, I think it would be great if more people voted and if more people actually voted for everything that was on the ballot. Uh, working in a borough president's race, we were the fourth thing on the ballot that you could vote for. Mayor first, then comptroller, then public advocate, then the borough president, 
And then some people had city council primaries as well, which would have been number five. But the drop off was considerate. Uh, I think it was close to, it was somewhere between 25 and to 30 percent of the people that went into the voting booth voted in, voted in some, if not, if not all of the, the top line uh, primaries and then didn't vote in our race at all. Um, and that's a little bit frustrating for me too. Uh, I, I want people to know about the candidates. I want people to understand our, the positions that they're offering and what the differences are between them. Um, but it's difficult to get that message out, even though we do spend significant amounts of money. Um, it's hard to break through the noise and to talk about, talk about real things. I'm actually curious about this drop off. People getting bored by the time they hit the second name, it's just too overwhelming. I just think there isn't, they don't have, they don't feel like they have enough information about the candidates to make an educated decision. Um, and that's unfortunate. Uh, you know, we try to, as a campaign, obviously we put out a lot of mail to people we think are likely to vote and make a ton of phone calls and knock a lot of doors. Uh, but it's difficult. There's not a ton of people that are really passionate about what the borough president office is about or, or who the candidates are. Um, and it can be difficult to get that message, that message to them. Yeah. Hi. Um, do you guys think that has anything to do with the media coverage of what's important and what's yes. not important? Because a mayoral election gets so much more publicity than yes. a borough president. Well, this year the Comptroller's race got a lot of attention because of Elliot Spitzer, um, because uh, you know because um, it appeals to our prurient interest. Um, <laughs> without redeeming social value, I think that was the uh, you're the you're the <laughs> lawyer. Um, so that got some attention, but. You know, free media is always going to be more powerful than paid media. Free media meaning news coverage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at, um, and, you know, somebody who's running for mayor, somebody who's running for president, somebody who's running to be executor to run the whole show is going to draw a lot more attention from reporters and editors. And don't forget you have editors who, you know, you have reporters who live vicariously through the people they cover, and then you have editors who live vicariously through the reporters who are living vicariously through the people they cover. Um, there's not as much attention paid. If you are lucky, you'll get one story on a, you know, in, the, in, a, in an entire election cycle on a, on a city council election, on a, state, you know, on, a, on a state legislative election. The editorial boards, which some people care about, but not nearly as many as the campaigns think care about the editorial boards, um, won't even endorse in every, in every in every contested race. It's almost like they're saying, we don't care. Um, I do think one of the really interesting questions about, uh, you talked about open primaries, you also have a situation in California now where the first two, the first, and it's always been the case, I think, in Louisiana, where the first two, the top two candidates, whether they're two Democrats, two Republicans, two whoever, go into the, you know, will go into the general election. So it's not even necessarily party-based. but. You know, one of the theories that gained some traction some time ago, I, don't, I haven't heard people talk about it recently, was a none of the above option on the ballot. <laughs> now, how many more people would come out? I mean, this is somewhat cynical, and I think people who vote for none of the above, you know, it's easy to be cynical. You know, it's one thing to be skeptical. It's much more destructive to be cynical. Uh, but if you had a none of the above option, how many people would come in there to throw the bums out? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, uh, and, and by the way, you know, all of you are now implicated in this, right? Because you can start a blog, you can write in this paper or any other, and if you're talking about a local race, you might be most of the, you might constitute most of the coverage of that race. And as you do it, you'll start to realize, as we do, that, you know, it, there's an art to this. You've got to try and figure out what, what will connect with people and what will be meaningful. Why should they, and you know, and you got to keep in mind, you're competing with everything. You're competing with real housewives, you know. You're competing with, uh, with, the, with the Wall Street Journal. You're competing with uh, Netflix. You know, you're trying to get some brain space um, and, and try to get people to focus on something. And that means you've got to write really good, snappy leads. And it means you've got to have unusual angles. And it's got, I mean, you've got to have 
strong writing, colorful characters, you know, a, a, a narrative that really sort of tries to capture the attention of people. And even after you do all of that, most people are not going to pick it up. So, you know, you, you are going into a profession where, you know, that's going to be the norm. You know, I mean, look, think, of it, think about it this way. Whenever there's a, um, a blood shortage, there's a story that's written, and I've done these. I don't know if you've ever done these. I've even gone and given blood. I work with the New York Blood Center, so please. Okay, continue. right. So, well, then you know. The <laughs> blood that keeps all of us alive is donated by 2% of the population. 2%. You know, so, you know, it's, it would be nice if it was more. It would be nice if it was 4%. It would be nice if it was 10%, but it's 2%. So 2% of the population is keeping everybody else alive who has to go get blood transfusions or go to the hospital or, or, or you know, get blood. So, you know, it could be that whether it's human nature or the particular political culture of this country, uh, a small number of people are doing a lot of, are carrying a lot of the weight. You know, for just continuing on that point about covering politics, what always struck me when I was a political reporter, and I covered Brooklyn and I covered City Hall from Koch in, you know, through Dinkins and into uh, Giuliani, and I never wanted to cover the White House, because I think local politics is far more interesting than national politics, um, that you, you, are the only, you as the reporter are the only person, pretty much, that talks to both sides in a dispute. Well, that's not just for elections, it's for all kinds of public policy disputes. You know, everybody's plotting against the other team, and you're the only one talking to both sides. And it's a kind of a unique, so, you know, I don't believe that journalistic objectivity exists. Because I think what we, you know, we all bring our own values, our own life experience, and that determines to some degree what we think is important. You know, the, the standard is what you think, though, is not relevant. I mean, it's relevant in terms of defining what you think, but you have to fight that. You have to check yourself. You have to be fair. I think that the, that the standard is fairness. I mean, Joe Loda, for instance, is, you know, I covered the Giuliani City Hall. He was the most refreshing. You know, the, the, he was a breath of fresh air in that administration. He was, he was the one who kind of, I wrote this in a piece I had in HuffPost, that he was the guy who escaped this, you know, this omerta, this cone of silence that was imposed by the Giuliani administration. And we as reporters, we used to have to take things he told us and put it off the record to kind of cover him, or else he would have been bounced out the door because they were such, you know, the Giuliani people were such, con were such control freaks. So, I mean, but, you know, so I'm, I'm also been a, been a registered Democrat. I love talking to Republicans. I might actually learn something. And you just have to, so I don't think you can be objective, but you must be fair. And I think one of the blessings of being a reporter is you actually get to talk to all sides of a dispute, which puts you in the odd position of sometimes knowing more about the dispute than everybody else who's actually involved in it. It's a very, as a social dynamic, of being a reporter. It's a very, you know, nobody analyzes it in that way. Maybe it's because I've done politics and I've done, you know, I've done journalism. It's a very unique role and it's your own ethical compass that has to check you. In other words, you're not there on one side. But to say that you're the only one that talks to everybody and you're not supposed to have opinions seems to me ludicrous. It's just, you know, I can't, I mean, I have opinions about everything. I'm a New Yorker, so I mean, how could I not have opinions? So right. How did you find the coverage for your candidate? Um, I thought it was I thought it was fairly well balanced. Uh, I just wanted to add quickly on this point. Um, I think the one thing that's neat about local races, uh, just consider the numbers. For example, I ran a city council race in 2009 in Western Queens, where 6,000 people voted. Here in the borough president race, 110,000 people voted, and these are pretty low numbers. I, I ran a congressional race where we had 500,000 people voting. Like, there's a big range, and the amount that you could have 500,000 people voting at a congressional race. There's only like 600,000 people in the uh, district. Uh, not because of the new census. It was three quarters of a million. Okay. There's three quarters of a million people really? in the congressional districts, basically countrywide now. Um, and, you know, high turnout in 2012 with the presidential. Um, so the amount that you can you can change and affect the course of a smaller race like that and be more involved in it is much higher than, than it is in something that's, that's a larger election. Um, yeah, I thought the coverage was fine, there just wasn't a lot of it. 
there wasn't, we didn't have a lot of opportunities to talk about what our positions were on the various things that the borough president does, whether that's land use or you know discretionary budget spending or what have you. But you also had a situation in the borough president's race where because of the political dynamics of the Queens Democratic Party, you had two you know, semi-behemoths. You had Peralta and you had Leroy Comrie choose not to go all the way through and run. That's true. So you would have had, if you had those four, and, and whether you have an ethnic filter, however you want to, you know, because I think that one of the things that the de Blasio election showed us is that the kind of identity politics, blacks vote for blacks, Latinos vote for Latinos, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, de Blasio beat Quinn among women, beat her among gay voters, split the black vote or got a little bit more of the black vote than, than, than Billy and even Thompson. Her, What's that? Her district, you, yeah, she won, he won Quinn's district. He won, so I mean, so, but I mean, that kind of, uh, that kind of identity politics analysis broke down. So, sure. but, uh, but I'm not sure it breaks down quite as much That's on the local level. Because people know less, that may be all they know about a candidate. <laughs> That's possible. But if, but if you had those other two candidates remaining in the race, might have been a very different dynamic. It would have been a very different Yeah, dynamic. just for a quick background, we had seven people running for Queensboro president when I started uh, on Melinda's campaign in May. And by the end, we only had three people who were actually on the ballot and active, actively running, and one didn't really have any resources. So it was really a, it was really a pretty much a head-to-head -head race. That brings me to a question I was going to ask later, but I'll ask it now. When I worked as a political reporter, there was a lot of talk. I was up in Western North Carolina. A lot of talk about what they called non-aggression pacts, where people would meet and. The Republicans would sit down with the Democrats and say, we won't run anyone in this race if you don't run anyone in this race. And we can never nail that story, because it was always... Well, a but that doesn't happen. I mean, that, ha that might happen in Westchester, where Democrats and Republicans have a chance. The only time you see that is like in judicial, when they put a judicial slate, they'll throw one to the Republicans, and so then everybody will cross-endorse everybody. But, I mean, that's different when you, because we have, as I like to say, we're a Democratic town, and we would never elect anybody but a Democrat as mayor, except for the last five times. So, <laughs> so what I mean, but in the, you know, but in a one part, but we're a, but we're a one party, you know, you might, you know, you have the kind of non-aggression pacts, if you will, that led Leroy Comrie to say, I'm not going to run, that led Jose Peralta to say, I'm not going to run. Those are, but those are intra-party, they're not inter-party, I think. No, that's right, and and it doesn't it doesn't in in a lot of these cases it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, people sort of uh, spelling it out in some back room and you know shaking hands and you know smoking cigars or whatever. Well, you're it not is. allowed to smoke in the um, rooms. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but it's it, it's you know it can just be a matter of self interest when people just say, look, it's it's not it's not worth it to me to sort of run some kamikaze mission. And frankly, there's another dynamic that goes on in Brooklyn. Um, I just heard the numbers last night, so I can't verify these, but one of my guests said this, that there are 5,000 members of the Conservative Party, there are 100,000 members of the Republican Party, and there are 1.1 million Democrats. Um, so how is it that a guy like Martin Golden, uh, a Republican state senator, continues there? Well, the Democrats will tell you, it's like, what the, the, the slang that they use is they say, he carries our stuff in Albany, you know, where the Republicans have a lot of influence in the state Senate, if you need something from the Republicans, it's good to have somebody there. And so the same Democrats- role that, uh, Same role that Peter King plays for the city in, the, in Congress. The Democrats could have wiped out Martin Golden, or they could have at least tried. And one would think that it's like, you know, look, he's the only remaining significant Republican official in the borough. Why don't you just steamroll over him since you've got the numbers? 10 to one, you know, Democrats and Republicans. And they don't do it. You know, and, and I think it's partly for that reason, that he's, he's of some use to them. Um, in, in a very practical way. And frankly, that's a case where, you know, it might seem like backroom politics, but it probably works out better for the citizens. You know, instead of just being some, some democratic enclave where you don't know anybody, you can't call anybody, and you get no hearing when you go to Albany on, uh, with important business. Um, I have a question about turnout. Um, in some countries, um, on the day of election, they either hold it, put it on the weekends, or they hold it on a day where everyone where, where there's no work, every business is shut down. Why don't they do it in this country? That's a great it's question. question. There's a website called Why Tuesday that is, it's dedicated to that, ex that very question. Why Tuesday? And um, why not early voting? And, you know, why not? Um, in New York, we have one more barrier, um, which is um, 
you can't do absentee ballot unless you have uh, get an absentee ballot unless you have a reason. Yeah, you have to go and tell them. You know, it's probably some sort of sworn statement. Actually, you have to tell them I'm going to be out of town or I'm going to be overseas or whatever it's going to be, as opposed to just saying, you know, I just I'd rather mail in my ballot or, and not, or, or same day registration. Right, that was the other point. Same day registration. I mean, like right now, the registration. If you want to vote on the in the November 5th general election, the registration deadline is this Friday, October 11th. So, so keep that in mind if you do want to vote. But also keep in mind, if you want to change parties or join a political party to vote next year, you have to do it by November of this year. We have all of these crazy hurdles, and that's one of them. And it gets enshrined in law. So the fact that we vote in the whatever it is, the first or second Tuesday of November. That's first Tuesday after the first Monday. And that, that's, not, that's not optional. That's, like, that's enshrined in law. So... Um, and these laws were written by people who have an interest in kind of keeping the turnout down or at least controllable. And that, I think, accounts for almost all of them. Yeah, and it, it, these are New York rules that we're mostly talking about here. They vary widely from state to state. Um, you know, I've worked in Iowa where they have in-person voting for 30 days prior to election day. You can go to your county auditor or you can vote with an absentee ballot with no reason whatsoever. That significantly increases voter turnout in Iowa as, a, as opposed to New York. But mm -hmm. each, each state has their own rules. It's not uniform. Um, and there's some pretty crazy ones out there, actually, that I think really do limit the number of people that vote in elections. You know, there's also, just one second, just, you know, I'm going to go back to the point of what's going on around the country. And there's a lot of people of color in this room that the wars and the people who died, literally, you know, for the, for the, right to vote for people who try, you once again have in particular the Republican Party trying to compress the electorate. And it's clear who they want to, they want to compress that portion of the electorate that's most likely to vote Democratic. So, um, you know, I guess it's a warning not to take for granted what your forebears literally died for. And so, I mean, this is not, um, this is not Pollyanna-ish. This is a this is a, sh you know, for those of us of a certain age, this is shocking. And, you know, it's hard to... I remember, wa I remember it, watching the Eyes on a Prize documentary talking about over the summer, around the weekend of the anniversary of the March on Washington, and it just amazed me, like, how much, like, guys like John Lewis and Bio Lyuza, all these people who sacrificed their lives. And you can, you can tell, like, every time you hear John Lewis speak, you can feel the passion. I mean, because he lived it. And to see this happening again. It's just, you know, so just, yeah, I'm sorry. You know, one of the things uh, that we're not talking about here as far as media coverage and sort of begs the whole question of coverage of the elections to begin with is where's the coverage of local office holders all the time? You know, I teach at the Graduate School of Journalism besides teaching here, and I asked my very advanced class there. Name one thing Bill de Blasio did as public advocate. Guess what? All these experienced journalists came up with nothing, zero. The problem is nobody covers what public advocates do. Nobody covers. I'd look at it a different way. You know what some of these other local people do? That's why we're not getting people coming out. I look at it a different way. They don't know way. what they do. Um, you know, I look at Scott. I, you know, I look at Scott Stringer, and I'm a Bill De Blasio fan. Um, as I told Errol, my daughter, my older daughter, got his daughter's hand-me-downs. My daughter's 16 and a half. His daughter's 18 and a half. <laughs> um, Scott Stringer, you know, Burrow, He's, you know, um, Melinda is going to go be is going to go become Borough President now. Bur uh, borough President, if you look at it on the books, is a bullshit job. Uh, is a I can't say that, is it? I'm Mike, you can't take it back. That will be the only thing quoted from the whole thing. <laughs> but, and, and so is public advocate. I mean, the only reason public advocate was created in the 1989 city charter was because you wanted a way for a minority candidate to be able to get elected citywide, and then David Dinkins got elected mayor, so that kind of shot that theory down. It's not going to work this time. Right. And so, well, it did work this time. It did work this time. But both jobs on the, if you look at what the, what their powers are, don't have a great deal of power. And so what it is incumbent upon is the skills of the individual office holder. I would argue that 
Stringer did extremely well with what levers he was given. He maximized. I don't think Bill did as public advocate, but having said that, the public advocate's budget was just devastated. The powers that be don't like the Office of Public Advocate. You know, we, they think, what do we need it for? We've got the Independent Budget Office. We've got the Comptroller can do some. You know, we have all these public um, ombudsmen, you know, all these people who give accountability. What do we need the job? But the job exists, and so they've kind of bled it by, by destroying the budget. So I think it's incumbent upon the skills of the individual office holders to... Um, to kind of force themselves into the debate. And if you force yourself into the debate properly, you know, you may have, you know, maybe it's a little bit too showbiz to get on, you know, to get on Errol's show, but you can take that, you can put substance into the showbiz. Those are not, those well, are not, the, the, those the, are not contradictory things. The, the, the question is who does that? It's not up to the officials necessarily to do that because that may not serve their interests. Frankly, some of them do want to play in the shadows where they can spend money and help their friends and do all or, kinds of other or stuff. Or get things done to be on a, not on a negative or, or to kind of accomplish. Either way, it is the job of the journalists to figure out how to cover that stuff. And it is a challenge. It is a big challenge. The, the most powerful tool you guys have as journalists will be your discretion to cover this story and not that story. You know, I mean, that's, that's just how it goes. Um, it's all a balancing act. I was, you know, I, I was a tabloid columnist for six years, and for two and a half of those years, I also had a talk radio show, you know, a, a morning drive at that, you know, where you have to really try to wake people up and talk about something. And so I'm not naive about what it takes to get people to pick up a newspaper. I mean, 60%, I don't know if the, the percentage has changed now, but when I was at the Daily News, 60% of their sales were on the newsstand. You know, they don't have a lot of subscriptions. And so that's why you see crazy stuff on the cover. You know, there's cleavage and there's Miley Cyrus and this and all, all of this other stuff. Because Sometimes they both, Miley because they want <laughs> Because they want, they, want people, they want people to pick it up. They want people to pick it up. And it paid me a good living. And so, like I said, I'm not naive about this stuff. Same thing with drive time radio. It's a, it's very, it's a very commercial medium, uh, you know. When, when all else fails, you know, it's 6.30 in the morning and you got to keep your audience interested, you start bashing the MTA, which is always a surefire yes. thing. The MTA stands for the money-taking agency. It's ATM spelled backwards. And those guys are, <laughs> those guys are crooks. And, you know, I mean, you, you just, you know. So I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not naive about that, you know. But on a more serious level, I was taught, and I will tell it to you, and I think it is true, that there's a Pulitzer Prize sleeping inside of every city agency. You know, Stewie Marks used to tell us that. You know, and it's like, it is, it is your job to go and find it. There is, there is rampant, it doesn't have to be sort of criminal wrongdoing, but there is waste, there is fraud, there is misunderstanding, there is mis malfeasance. There, there, is, uh, there are problems that lead to what we started out talking about, a, a, a disaffected populace that doesn't feel like their tax dollars and their votes or mean anything, and so they turn to other means to try and make their lives and their family lives better. So it is, it is our job, and you know, we're, we don't always do such a good job. I mean, it is, it, is, it is tough, it is tough. You've gotta get something on the front page, you've gotta move stuff, you've gotta keep your audience interested, and you're competing with everything in the world. Um, you've also, though, you've gotta do the basics. The basics will never go away. You have to be a good storyteller. You have to learn how to be a better storyteller. You have to develop sources. You have to go out and talk to people. You know, and, and, and you know, chasing around after the mayor and trying to get a comment from the mayor in the Daily Avail, that's fine. But your time is much better spent, you know, sort of probing and befriending and buying coffee and, 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 and meeting the people who Finding are- Finding a third level person and buying them a chicken salad sandwich. The you know? <laughs> in the procurement <laughs> office, you know, it's a gold mine. The people there who handle the contracts, it's a gold mine. Um, you know, figure out a way to have people bring you uh, the, the, the real story of what's going on in the city. Let, me also, let me also disagree with you one other way. Sure. Um, Most people do. <laughs> technology, you know, I, you know, I believe that technology, I be, I'm, a, I'm emotionally a Luddite. I believe that technology is going to drive us all into these little atomized 
um, the you know, world that we're all going to live in our little bubbles. My former job, people would, you know, I came out of come out of a newspaper business where people yelled at each other in the newsroom. Now they email to the next desk. Um, but having said that, technology has not it has done, you know, from a journalistic point of view, the good, the bad thing is that it's segmented journalism, it's created the echo chamber where people who are right wing only talk to people who are right wing. It's the it's the MSNBC Fox phenomenon. But at the same time, both weekly papers in the boroughs, in this particular town, there's a thriving weekly um, newspaper world and online. I mean DNA info, you know, people like that who cover neighborhoods. Now you know, the, the more local you get, because there's nobody watching them, there's, you know, I mean, are they really being honest? Are they in bed with the people they cover? That's the, that's a question you can ask about the New York Times. So, I mean, you know, right, you know, when you ask about the Queen's Tribune, I mean, so I'm, so, yes, in the, in the mainstream newspapers, and remember, in a city, it's a newspaper more than, you know, much more than TV, because you can't put a videotape on the refrigerator. You know, a, you know, a newspaper is kind of the commonality in most cities. You know, most cities you have one newspaper. We're lucky we have three. If you count, you know, if you count El Diario, you got four. If you count the Wall Street Journal as a New York section, we got five. If you count, well, if you count the Chinese papers, we have twenty. But I don't understand anything that goes on in in those papers. But there's a thriving Chinese language daily media culture. So you do have opportunities to cover those things, and it takes a little bit more work to learn what's going on in your community by reading those papers. So I'm um, so I'm not so while I agree with you on a you know something that's you know it's the opposite of broadcasting and narrowcasting, whether it's newspaper or or electronic. It's there, and there are people covering it. You may not get it in the, in the mainstream dailies, but you but there are places online, and, and so that's the good that's the good part about the tip, about you know the technical lot of the the you know the way in which journalism can benefit from uh, from the technological revolution. You know, one thing, Cliff, going back to what you said, and also to Errol's show, but another thing that I think that's really important here, and maybe I would like you guys to comment on this: How much of an obligation does the press have, especially in local politics and most local issues, to educate the public about what's at stake and the powers that are at play? In other words, you know, it's one thing to come in and cover something in the aftermath and talk about the outcomes or the impacts of certain news stories, but how much of an obligation is there for the local press? Uh, I think Errol does it on his show to some degree, and we see a little bit, a little bit of elsewhere. How much of an obligation to really educate news consumers about what the news really is in the landscape? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a permanent obligation. Exactly. It's a permanent obligation, and as we all suffer from declining readership and collapsing audiences, the only thing that comes across in the market data that's consistent is that people feel like they're getting, you know, data rather than useful information, right? So you, we run on all of these numbers, you know, every day. I'm sure you guys all see it. The Dow Jones was up five points. Who the hell cares, right? I mean, you know, what does it mean? What does it mean? You don't, what does it mean? <laughs> you don't invest in the Dow in the Dow well, Jones. I mean, also, I mean, like, even you invest like in individual Blo stocks. Bloomberg they, News, they they tell you the percentage. Okay, the market is up two percent, three percent. Okay, that starts to be something useful that you might be able to make sense of. But you know, it's 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 true across the board. It's considered old school, by the way. You know, there's some there's some notion among some of the younger people in the business on the digital platforms that, you know, that what gets clicks is what matters, and you just follow the audience. They want to see kittens doing backflips, then that's what, that's what it is. I uh, watch, I watch you know, those. Um, <laughs> or if they're, if they're, you know, if they're interested in some celebrity gossip, then that's what that is. I'm old school. I, I try to come on every night and say, hi, thank you for joining us. Here's, what import here's what's important. We dug up something important for you. You know, please be quiet and listen. You know, um, and and act accordingly. You know, um, not everybody does that. Not everybody does that. But there there will always be work because I'm I am certain about that. I've been doing this for thirty years. I am certain about this. People will stay with you. People will come to you if you give them information that they need, and they are expecting that because you're doing this twenty four hours a day that you know something that they didn't know. You know, because they were off. They're off taking care of their families and, and living their lives, and the reason they're paying that cable bill 
or plunking down 75 cents for the newspaper or turning on the radio. $2.50 is, is that they assume that you are doing your job, that they assume that we are doing our job. And frankly, you know, it's, a, it's an important responsibility. And you should ask yourself, am I really doing my job? You know, and, and so after a good show, I always tell our team, I'm like, we gave people their, their cable bills worth. You know, we want them to be happy that they're coughing up that 150 bucks a month or whatever it is to, to have Time Warner Cable or Cablevision because we want to over deliver. We want to we want to give people stuff all the time through as many channels across as many platforms as we possibly can. That's that is what the business is, and it sort of always was. But um, you know, the, and it's true all the way down to the local level. If anything, the stakes go up. Where it's like. You know, you may not think what happens in this little city council primary matters, but it does, and here's why. And frankly, if you can't answer that, you probably shouldn't be working on the story, or you need more information. Um, you've got to make sure you understand why it's important and why people need to know what you're doing. The other point is that people, you know, people bitch, I think I can say people bitch about things. That's, that's I think, okay. Uh, people bitch about, you know, the New York Post, that it's, you know, some right wing, I, I'm old enough to have worked, I'm old enough to have seen the Brooklyn Dodgers play. I'm old enough to have uh, worked at one point in the Carter administration when the Washington Times, which was then owned by the, Unif by the Unification Church, by the, by the Moonies, was this arch right-wing newspaper came in. And all the people in the Carter White House said, we're not going to read that red. And my attitude was, you're nuts. You should, you know, it's like a window into your opposition. That, you know, I mean, what a luxury to have the Washington Times to see what are the conservatives who are coming after you, what they're thinking about, you know? And that's what, you know, you have, you have the luxury in this city of multiple points of view that are available at your fingertips or on the newsstand. And if you want to be an informed citizen, nobody's going to hand feed it to you, but pick it up and figure it out. See what the Post says, see what the Times says, see what the Wall Street Journal says, see what the news says. I mean, you have a luxury in that, and you should, and then let Errol explain what it all means. <laughs> so, but I mean, but, but, it's a, but it's a luxury that when, you know, it's like people who complain about the New York Post saying they won't read it. If you disagree with the New York Post, I would read the New York Post every day. If I'm going to disagree with them, great. Now, the New York Post happens to have tremendous reporters. I mean, whatever, you know, their biases are in their editorial pages, and sometimes it bleeds over into editors choosing what goes where. I mean, sure that happens. Sure. But you've got other places to look. You can, you can filter it through your own experience. We're all intelligent people. We're, we're informed people. So instead of, you know, bitching that these people don't have the right attitude, we have, fill it out. We're, we're a couple of weeks away from the, um, the anniversary of Hurricane Sandy, which was the case for we have something important that we need to tell you. There's a storm coming. It's going to wipe out parts of the city. You could drown. You could die. You could be seriously inconvenienced. The subways are going to be shut down. All this kind of stuff that's going on. And but I think everyday journalism is only slightly less important than that. You know, I mean that's that was compressed and that was very dramatic and the stakes were very very high. But the stakes are high in fracking. The stakes are high with casino gambling. The stakes are high with you know any number of different schools. issues. Schools for sure. Um, you know your tuition here. Everything else. Right. So. You should, you know, you have to approach it every day like you're, you're, you're the weatherman, right, or, or weather woman, or whatever it's called, and, and you, you're looking, you're looking down, <laughs> you're, you're looking, you're looking down the road. I mean, 2014 is coming. It's going to be statewide elections. What are the top issues going to be? You know, we're already starting to to try and talk about that stuff. We're not even done with this election, but we're thinking, you know, fracking is going to be important. Gambling is going to be important excuse me, the tax base in a lot of these little towns that are about to go under. Um, you know, the upstate economy, which has been a disaster for generations. What, what is, you know, where does all of this, what are we going to do? And again, the, that discretion question, what can we actually cover with the resources that we have? What will make sense? And, you know, and how do we do it? Is it a recurring series? Is it, are we going to do it for a month? Are we going to do a string of packages? How are we going to do this? And that's what a big part of your business is going to be is that you're going to be sitting around, sometimes by yourself, thinking, OK, with the time and the resources that I have, what can I do that's going to have the kind of impact that I want to have? You know, and it depends on who you're working for, you know, who your audience is and what they need to know. But you should always be asking that. And when people stop asking that, that's when you get bad journalism. <laughs>
Yeah. Errol made one very a, a point that goes right to a point I always had. I, I taught in covering local politics at the Columbia J School when I was a reporter as an adjunct. And one of the, you know, it was very interesting to hear him talk about the 2014 elections, because one of the points I always made, because I was a political reporter, is that, you know, politics is not like covering Hurricane Sandy, in which there's like these defined facts. The storm is going to hit today, the impact is going to be here. It's not a covering a fire, which, by the way, is the greatest contained story to cover. It's got, a, you know, it has heroes, it has, you know, it's just a, you know, it has a, be you know, most stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Politics has no, politics is all middles. You know, while we're running up to the 2013 election, not only is Errol Lewis thinking about the 2014 election, so are political people all over the city and all over the country already talking about 2016. So, you know, you, you have signposts, elections are signposts, polls are signposts. Them, you know, I think people spend too much time focused on money, but, you know, how much money you raise, there are signposts along the way, but politics is all middles. You know, it's kind of a never-ending... You know, so I think talking about the 2014 elections, that's how not only political reporters think, that's how political people think. So. I'm really curious about shaping the message. And since you've been talking about this, who's in charge of it? Are the campaigns shaping coverage, or does coverage shape the campaign? If we're doing our job, we're shaping the coverage. I mean, that's theoretically what I'm, what I'm there for, and communication teams are, are there to do. Um, I think it's important for people like Errol and other journalists to cut through the crap and figure out what actually what actually is a story, what's truthful about what the campaign is saying, what's, where are they shading and hiding the truth, um, that sort of thing. Uh, but obviously, it's a two-way street. It's a never-ending. It's a never-ending conversation between the campaigns and the and the journalists. Um, we can we can do our job and still not get the story that we want, but. If we're doing our, the right thing and talking about how our candidate is the best thing that since sliced bread and has all these fantastic ideas that they're going to do once they're in office, obviously it helps. And just if you're effective at your job, you're helping to at least do something to shape shape the message of the campaign. Um, but it's it's definitely a two-way street. I mean, through, through a slightly different lens, uh, the political people are trying to do the same thing we're trying to do, which is figure out what's important to the people who, you know, pay all of us and, um, and, and, you know, try to convert their concerns and needs and interests into something real, real something tangible, you know, and that's, I mean, that's what public service is, including the elections. And, um, yeah, we could, I mean, you know, we could, I, I haven't talked to you before, but I mean, I collaborate with these folks all, with folks all the time. They'll come to you and say, we're planning a big study on, you know, subprime lending and how it's caused a lot of foreclosures in the neighborhood. I'm like, okay, fine, I know something about that, tell me more. And people pitch stuff all day. And that, again, you sort of weed through it, and you try to use your own, you know, your instincts, your judgment. Um, uh, but the, the, the political class, they're very much drivers of the narrative. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying, when I talked about 2014, we want to try and get ahead of it so that we try without a lot of the noise and a lot of the pressure and a lot of the politics to say, this is what's actually important. Now, the politicians may all decide that some you know, fight over charter schools is going to be the dominant issue of the 2014 elections. But in the calm, the relative calm before that storm, we want to try to you know, sort of think through what, what's really important. You right. know? But you're also looking at a 2014 where Governor Cuomo, at this point, is the 800-pound gorilla. And it doesn't look like there's any credible challenge at this point to his reelection. So how does that affect, I mean, how many days can you say? I mean, it's like, how do you cover this election where, um, you know, Loda, who's a very credible guy, who I do think has not run a good campaign, but is a much better guy than he's been a candidate, a much more, when I say better guy, I mean he's a better public-spirited Man, he's he's extremely bright. He cares a great deal. He's a, you know, he's a credible public servant. But you have De Blasio with a with a fifty point lead. So you know, how do you cover that, and how do you prepare to cover an election next year, where the governor right now seems virtually unchallenged? Well, sometimes you know, sometimes the media will have to step in, not with a challenge per se, but with some agenda set. You know, I mean, because what you don't want to do is just run from press conference to press conference and let whoever's in power uh, just kind of dictate 
the issues that are worth covering. I mean, that's, that's sloppy, that's bad journalism, and that, that opens the door to all kinds of problems, one of which, on a professional level, is that somebody else can come in and just eat your lunch. You know, the, the, you know so the, 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 the Guardian newspaper has a very active New York City bureau, and they just came up with a story that, like, just I almost fell out of my chair. I was like, oh my God, how did these guys get this? There's an Australian company that has bought up 40 or 50 houses in central Brooklyn, in low-income areas, Bed-Stuy, 40 or 50 houses, it's a lot. Um, they're, they're putting like three or four hundred thousand dollars into renovating and upscaling each one of those. And it, that's enough to have a market impact. They're taking houses off the market, they're, they're making the rents go up, and then they're gonna be able to flip them after some six or seven year period because they're a foreign corporation, they can turn around and flip the houses. That's like, that's just huge. So and I'm like, how does British newspaper get this? In my neighborhood. <laughs> 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 as deeply as <laughs> That's a professional affront. How did they do this? So so there's, you know, you don't you don't want that. I mean look, this AP, the AP guys, Matapuzo and the other guy, they got Pulitzer Prizes investigating the NYPD and their their, Muslims, their, their Muslim surveillance program. You know, how many how many reporters are here in New York? How many people sit down at the shack, the so-called, you know, the vaunted police reporters who are, who are down there at one police plaza day in and day out, and two guys from Washington come in and eat their lunch? You don't, you don't want that. You don't want that. Maybe, maybe another issue along that line, uh, another guy at, at, at the J School, his buddy Stein, I don't know. I know, buddy. No, well, but... Uh, from the, buddy, from the Riverdale the, Press. Yeah, yeah, he used to own the Riverdale Press. And as far as I know, he's the only local community news guy to win a Pulitzer Prize. Now, there was one in California also. Is there another same one? Thing. Yeah, it was almost that same year. Yeah. You know, who won, you know, for covering community news. Right. So obviously, one of the things that, you know, Buddy and I know each other for a while, one of the things he always talked about is like what it takes to make local news sexy enough so people will care. And along those lines, what can these guys do covering local news What's the thought process in making stories sexy enough so people will care? Did, was anybody, anybody here a fan of uh, The Wire? I mean, it's been oh, off the yeah, air yeah. now for years, but yeah. it's a wonderful, I mean, it's just a wonderful series. And this, the city was the star, really. It was a story about Baltimore. Mm -hmm. And it was just told through a number of different angles. Mm -hmm. What was going on at the docks, what was going on in the drug trade, what was going on down at City Hall, and there were all interesting little connections, vivid characters. It was a journalist who put it all together. The guy who, who came up with it had worked at the Baltimore Sun. And he decided, I can't tell the story of this city within the confines of journalism. Let me go out here and just create this crazy story, which we all now know, love, and remember. I would say, if you haven't seen it, take a look at it. I think it's, it's somewhere. It's on Netflix or some damn place, or HBO. And, um, and um, you know, see your, see, I would say try to understand your job as something big and important. You know, you are asking for the responsibility of telling the story of a great city. And it's a series. It's a serial. It's a soap opera. It goes on for years. It started before you got here. It's going to go on after you're gone. But you, are, you want to step in and you want to tell a piece of it. It doesn't matter how small that piece is. It's a piece of that story. And you should try to think about how it fits into the larger picture. Yeah, the more local the story, the more I think it directly impacts people, people's lives, or at least can. I mean, for example, one thing we pushed on our campaign is the fact that Queens, a borough of 2.2 million people, only has nine functioning hospitals right now. That's ridiculous. The number of beds for this, for this borough is, is pitiful. And there's a couple that are threatening closure. Uh, the, only, the only hospital in the Rockaway Peninsula, St. John's, is... Uh, on the brink of shutting down. I think about how far those folks would have to go to have emergency room care. Um, so there's, there's small things that are happening in every neighborhood, whether it's flooding here in Southeast Queens, which is a major issue for, for local homeowners, to, to a number of other things that you know, really can, can alter their, their lives for, for years to come. But also, look at the difference between the coverage of St. Vincent's closing in Greenwich Village. Or Long Island. Or Long Island College Hospital, which is in Brownstone, Brooklyn, and compare it to the lack of coverage that St. John's has gotten. And that also tells you something about, as opposed to community-based papers, when you look at a citywide basis, it's a Manhattan-centered 
media universe. So I, I, mean, I started out in community papers. My, my first job out of college, I turned down an offer from the Wall Street Journal to go work on Jeralman Street at a now defunct tabloid for the princely sum of $150 a week. And even those checks started bouncing. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I wouldn't do it any differently, I guess. But, but um, you know, but even then, the reason I did it was, I was like, I don't want to write about fancy Wall Street transactions. It's important and it's even interesting in its own way, but that's, that's not for me. I want to go and I want to catch murders and corruption and Spires. and get into the thing. I like murders better. Oh, um, and, and you know, I want to I want to be in this thing, and I want to tell the story of what's going on here. And you know, you, you got plenty of time. You know, you, you catch your breath, take your time, make some smart choices, and you know. There will always be a need for good storytellers. And don't, this is easier to say, is don't get hung up on stardom. You know, because uh, especially in print, you're not going to get rich. Uh, but oh, yeah, you if you're doing this get, for money, you know. You, but you can have a very, <laughs> but it's a very satisfying, but it's, in, but it's intellectually satisfying. And he's right, you can do a lot of good. So, and that motivated and me. And you have some laughs, you can have a lot of fun. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, awesome. Um, you mentioned um, about discretion. You were talking about using your discretion as a journalist. Um, how do you balance giving the audience what they want, maintaining like high ratings on, you know, uh, on the news, and being able to be a good journalist and cover every angle as opposed to just giving people what they want to hear? Because it might ask not you, be what's best for them. Let me put that in an immediate context for you too, because what's going on in Washington now with the, with the government shutdown, and there were journalists, particularly at CNN, drives me nuts, they're trying to take a balanced approach, saying it's a plague on both your houses, when by any objective analysis, That's a Republican. it's a Republican cause shutdown, but there's a fear to say it's the Republicans' fault. Because, well, you, you, because they don't want to be accused of being biased? Well, it's like, you know, uh, let, some let, things let, are not balanced. Well, let, let me ask you a question. When I was at the, when I was at the Daily News, I wrote twice a week, um, so I had 100 columns a year, is the way I would think of it. It's like, okay, I got 100 columns. How many am I going to spend, you know, trying to get Troy Davis off of death row? You know, I wrote five or six. Uh, how many am I going to spend trying to find the killer of Chanel Petro Nixon, the little girl in my neighborhood who was strangled, they still haven't caught the killer. And so that would be four or five, you know. And so, you know, you just, you, you just kind of budget it, you know, because what will happen is the readers will start to understand. And what I soon realized was if you write about something once a month, you might feel like I'm really kind of slow walking this. But from the reader's point of view, they're like, it's a constant update. You know? So I mean, that was just something you, you learn along the way. It's the same thing with radio, across any platform. You, you just make some decisions about how, what kind of story you want to tell. Understand that you're going to have to tell it on the installment plan, because you can't just be, you know, you, it, uh, I, I um, sometimes, in talking to students, compare it to running a restaurant. You've got to have a menu that's got a lot of stuff in it. And that includes some stuff that's fattening, you know, and that includes some stuff that's junk food, and that includes some nutrition as well. So, um, and it's an art. It's an art. So you, you've got to figure out what kind of restaurant you want to run. It's you, know, kind you, want to, you want to serve, you know, greasy, fatty food. There's some people who will buy that up until the moment they keel over and die in front of you. Um, but hopefully we're we're in the nutrition business, so we're gonna give people their vegetables and you know and a little bit of starch and. Oh, okay. okay. So let's just say, for instance, like with Joe, Lo, um, is that his name? No, to Bill De Blasio with the whole right. idea of him having an African American son. That was like right. a really that was like a really big right. deal. So that took. I want to be the I, I want to be Dante De Blasio's agent. That's what, <laughs> that's, <laughs> my, that's my that's one of my goals. That yeah. took on a lot of press. It was like you know it was everywhere. As opposed to you mentioned um, Mona, who you mm -hmm. felt was a. I, can I say that you felt he was a better candidate? No 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 no. I'm just saying he's a. <laughs> he's, he's better a, than his campaign he's shows. Better than his yeah. can than his campaign shows. Yeah. Okay. I don't think he's a better candidate. I think De Blasio ran a tremendous campaign. Okay. So. Well, but I mean, but that's a perfect example. You know, right. people fell in love with the Afro. You know, and and, and <laughs> at, if as a reporter you're out on the campaign trail and you see what the reporters were telling me, which is that people were lined up ten and twenty deep in Harlem waiting to shake his hand 
And every other one of the women who were like sort of middle-aged would say, where's the kid? I want to see the kid with the afro. Now, you can say, I'm going to squelch and suppress that because I don't think that's important. But that's not really the right way to yeah, do it. But when you the right way to do it is to show it. I mean, it's a phenomenon. I mean, and I, look, I was in Iowa when, when Obama won. And I was actually with him in 04 when he gave that first speech at the, uh, the Democratic National Convention. Sometimes there's just a phenomenon. It just happens. And, you know, you, you, know, you can try and figure out why after the fact, but you do have to report it. And, um, it, Wait, again, that's, that's one story out of, you know, what are you, you're going to probably do 200 a year. But journalistically, when you look at the, at the path that this mayoral race took, where you started out with, the era, with Christine Quinn as the heir apparent, you know, and all of a sudden Anthony Weiner jumps, in, jumps into the race and George, he sucks all this attention to him for good reasons, that he was kind of the most creative and inventive guy in the race, and for not so good reasons, which is because of the sexting scandal. Uh, you know, what that told you is that Chris's support was very wide and incredibly thin. Um, then when he implodes a second time with the, when he says, okay, this actually went on a year after it went on, destroying himself, that's the same point, virtually the same point, the same week, I think, which, in which Dante de Blasio's ad went on the air. And so, you know, it was, when you talk about it, it's just one of those things, absent that timing, the, you know, well, Wiener implodes this incredible ad with Dante de Blasio, goes on the air, captures huge public attention. Those two things together drew it. People all of a sudden started paying attention to Bill de Blasio. So, um, you know, so it's not the best laid plans. I mean, sometimes, you know, you've got to be, you know, it's the, old, it's the old expression that the harder I work, the luckier I get, that you have to have put all that all that legwork and all that framework in place so that if something happens, you can take advantage of it. And he was, you know, one thing Bill de Blasio is, is a superb operative. You know, the man has run campaigns. So it's, you know. Nobody, no, I mean, look, nobody could, have, nobody could have predicted it. You know, nobody could have predicted it. That happened to be what the mood of the city was, that they were ready for the, the Blasio message. Let's let her give it a chance. Okay, um, sorry. Uh, the, the issue of uh, de Blasio and his son. I, I want to believe that there was someone who went into the community to find out what people were saying about de Blasio and probably the fact that there was no connection. And bringing his son out brought a connection. And people began to see that, oh, he has a son that looks like me. You he know? has an interracial family. Exactly. Right? So the point is, there was someone who took it upon himself or herself as an obligation to find out what people had against de Blasio and try to bring out something that would attract them to him. Yeah. Now, the, uh, my, my question would be, is there an organization for the media in, in all, all over the US that could bring together uh, journalists to help them understand the magnitude of the responsibility they have to the people to be able to give out information be it on election, uh, be it on their daily lives, just the information that will make them have, uh, you know, informed decisions. Well, I, I hate to tell you, this is it. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is, this is it. You know how I learned? Okay, what I, I, never, right I never took a journalism class in my life. Here's how I learned journalism. I was in a, a summer program, and they said, take your pad and go down to the Brooklyn Criminal Court and find a story. And if you can't find a story in the Brooklyn Criminal Court, you will never be a journalist. <laughs> I, was, I worked for Jimmy Carter and wound up as the Florida press secretary. And I can say this with a clear conscience. I'm the only man in the history of the country to have used the White House as a stepping stone <coughs> to the Daytona Beach Bureau of the Orlando Sentinel. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's where I, you know, I made my mistakes with nobody looking at me, you know? <laughs> so that's, so journalism is actually one of those things that you learn by doing. And in yeah. fact, I would argue that the credentialization, I hate to say this at a college with a teaching journalist, I think that traditionally, when, when we grew up, there, were, there are two differences. People became reporters in the cities that they grew up in and therefore knew a lot better rather than people who market hop in order to get to the you know, number one market. You were connected to your city in a way that you weren't. 
And a lot of reporters were hired because we weren't otherwise employable, because we didn't play well with others. There's a whole different, you had to be street smart, but now you also need that piece of paper. I'm not going to downplay the importance of that piece of paper, but that piece of paper well, doesn't you, necessarily... You, you st right, you still have right. to be nosy and have a short right. attention span and, you know, <laughs> be a good storyteller, you know. One, the one thing that has changed, though, is, especially more in New York and the larger cities, with the rise in local reporting, hyper-local reporting, and all the, the new avenues, more and more journalists are not going out of town to get their basic training and then coming back. I hope so. To New York City jobs. They're growing up in journalism, in hyper-local reporting, and then moving to a broader, to broader audience. So in a way, it changes that pattern a bit. That would be nice. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned in the very beginning that you weren't too worried about the low voter, tr voter turnout because of different activists, including getting money. Shouldn't, isn't this problematic to democracy, though, that we're starting to see more people view the dollar sign as a vote? I mean, you, of course, are getting, doing your job if you get more money, but shouldn't we as journalists be shedding more light on the fact that this is a, this is a, a democratic problem besides talking about citizens united? Especially especially concerned today they're having the Supreme Court case about um, Taking yeah, McCulloch gets, yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a permanent issue. Yeah. Um, I, I'm i sort of agnostic about it, to tell you the truth. I mean, I, I think it's a mistake to just assume, you know, there's money going into a race, and therefore there's a problem. I mean, like, let's say you guys wanted to form a PAC. You know, let's say you wanted to go and, and push the CUNY board to do something about tuition or give you, you know, a new dorm or something like that, and we just passed the hat and everybody put in $10, you would be surprised if somehow there was a story saying this is corrupt, that these students are corruptly trying to influence, you know, well, because the, the they would have to report. It. <laughs> well, no, I mean, but you know, so so you 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 know, I said so. Be a little bit mindful of that. You know, there are most people who give money are giving it in very, relatively small amounts. I mean, make sure you have a story. I guess if you if you want to go down that route, um, I personally think it's a little bit overblown. I do. I mean, I agree you know, with you. I think the, the one, hope, the one definite upside of having a smaller electorate is that they tend to be more uh, well informed about who the candidates are and what the. You guys got outspent, right? Uh, and we both hit the cap, so. No, okay, you no, hit no, the really. cap. You were in the campaign finance. But, I mean, but there there are any number of races. I mean, it, there was there were spectacular examples in the 2012 election. The NRA put tons of money into races, and they lost one after another. I mean, we just saw two candidates. Uh, um, the Katz Matidis, he spent five million dollars and lost. And um, Spitzer spent ten million, ten million dollars of his own money. Former sitting governor, when he announced that he was going to run, he was at forty-six percent in the polls. On election day, he came in at forty-seven percent. He completely. But that was because of free media coverage, because news coverage dominated anything he could have done in paid advertising. Well, but, but well, there's there's that, but there's al there's also the notion that the voters. They knew him, and they didn't want him, the Democratic primary voters. Um, you know, you also made a point, you know, when the, your question made, uh, going back to the idea of, you know, older reporters being otherwise unemployable. I always said that in New York City we had not very good-looking TV reporters, and if you are not very good-looking TV reporters, you've got to be a good reporter. Um, <laughs> but, you know, in the olden, pardon me being in the olden days, reporters were not very well paid. And reporters today, when you get into the major newspapers, it's changing now as unions are being busted and wage scales are being driven down. But there's a long period of time where reporters are pretty well, I still think it's a blue, I think it's the top of the blue collar line. I don't think it's a white collar job. I think it's the top of the blue collar pay scale. Mm -hmm. How much do they identify with people in Brownsville, people and you know, they're, you know, they may think that it's great that this Australian company is buying up all these houses and planning to gentrify a significant swath of Bedford, you know, of Bedford Stuyvesant. So, you know, again, the degree to which your own experiences and your own life values, you know, don't say I'm gonna slant my story, but determines in your own mind what you see as important. The good when, when, when reporters are making a lot more money than their readers. There's a good series of stories to be done on donors. Who gives money and why? There's a story in the Times today about Lotus White, who's a professional fundraiser, and that's kind of interesting, but we don't know very much about it. I don't know that many people who routinely write checks for political candidates. I don't know what it is they think they're buying. 
I don't know what percentage of their income they're giving away. You know, maybe it's a good investment, depending on what they're getting in return, either ideologically or even in commercial. Well, I think terms. it's you know, ideological is different than getting a commercial return. You know, writing a check to somebody because you believe in their in their ideology without necessarily thinking of that there's a quid pro quo, other than an ideological quid pro quo, it's very different than the kinds of suggestions. You know, Bill De Blasio has gotten gotten a lot of support from the taxi fleet owners. Now, some people want to say he's beholden to the taxi fleet owners. Well, maybe he believes, you know, in what, you know, in taxi drivers, and it's a tough job. And so that money follows his position as opposed to that money determining that position. So, you know, that kind of a, that's a weighing act that, that you're never going to find a smoking gun. It's never going to be, you know, you, you know, you can, you know, that's one of those stories, and with a lot of stories in politics, you lay out the story. You don't have to draw a conclusion. Just describe the situation. And let people make their own conclusions. So, because there's, you know, there's not, you know, politics again. It's pushing and shoving, and there's no clear roadmap all the time to, to motives. Motives are as muddled as everything else in life. And because it's muddled, it's, you're almost never really wrong, Tom. Um, thank you all for coming. By the way, I just want to say that, and, and to Professor Hughes, my my dear colleague, desk right next to me. Thank you very much. Professor for Hughes. The hell out of us. Professor Hughes. Is Professor that what Hughes. Oh, okay. Just got <laughs> tenure, by the way. Can you put the mentor hats back on? And you gave a little bit of job advice, like uh, a little earlier, but give it with the. Uh, with maybe with, with the uh, digital uh, with digital journalism in mind, web journalism in mind, where you might not get paid a little, for a little while or for a long while, but you could still there's so many opportunities. There's a lot more opportunities. Can you each give your take on that? About these guys get their bachelor's degrees in journalism. What should they do to lay the foundation? Other than work for the school paper, of course. Many editors are here. Good idea. Uh, the, can you mentor a little bit about that? I'd love to hear your take on it. Um, good internships, obviously. Um, if you've got one or two more summers left, not the make times, the best of because it. the times is prestigious, but it doesn't give you a byline. You want to get clips. Go to a paper that will let you get a byline as it is when you're an intern. I um, I worked for a lot of community papers, and um, when I was starving, city limits, you know, kept me alive. And um, uh, one one thing I stumbled onto, I mean, for whatever it's worth, is a long, long, long time ago, is um, I used to do uh, book reviews. And um, I'd go and read a book that I probably would have read anyway. And they'd pay you, you know, at the time it was 75 bucks, which is a meaningful amount of money in my life at the time. And you got to keep the book. You travel with people. And the, beauty, the real beauty of it was you, you weren't expected to do a lot of reporting. You know, so it wasn't like I was putting in weeks of effort and chasing people down and having to field phone calls for, you know, for 40 or 50 bucks, which is what a lot of the other papers were pay paying. I actually got slightly more. And I got to do slightly less. You got to really think about that. <laughs> the, 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 the other thing that I did, and this, I, I literally made a living for a year on this, is I pitched all kinds of magazines, all kinds of stories. And they never took a single one of my pitches. But they would turn around and say, could you finish up this story because somebody else blew their deadline and we have to put this thing to bed. And I made a living off of journalists who could not meet their deadlines. You know, I mean, there was that. There was that much of it. Which is also a cautionary tale. Well, <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I mean, you must make don't deadlines. don't That's be right. the one who makes somebody like me possible. You know, or me in 1986, because me in 1986, I was you know, I, I went to Essence magazine. I like to do a story on prostitution. They're like, we're never going to do a story on prostitution. However, somebody else blew their deadline, so please finish this up. And it was great because they they give you the lay of the land, and it was understood that you only had 10 days to do it. So. That was an automatic check on me, sort of, you know, doing three thousand dollars worth of work for a one thousand dollar check, um, and, you know, be consistent, be reliable, be professional. You have no idea how far that will take you because there are a lot of people who will pitch a story, who will get the thing started, and for whatever reason they can't finish it. Deadlines are wonderful organizing principles. I mean, I always said that if I had twenty minutes to write a story, it took me twenty minutes. If I had two weeks to write a story, I waited for the last 20 minutes. <laughs> but I always made deadlines. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you must make, uh, the only advice I would have is, if you're interested in print, is get clips. However you get it, get clips. You, you know, it's one thing to convince a person how wonderful you are 
it's another thing to show a work product. And a clip is, can be electronic, and, you know, it can be digital. It doesn't have to be hard print. And that is, you know, I mean, I assume the same would apply to radio and stuff like that. Get those clips. I'd also say in the, in the new multi-platform world, you should be using tools so that you can sell the story across different platforms. So if you're going to go cover an event, shoot some decent video if you can, get some broadcast quality sound, because you have to record it anyway, even if you're doing a print story. Well, if you're going to record it anyway, record it at digital quality, at broadcast quality. Ozzy does that. Ozzie, you see Ozzy Paper, who's now at Capitol New York. He's and out there covering stories, taking, taking video and taking audio. And I, can I can tell you for sure, um, radio stations, they are hungry for, for broadcast quality audio. They don't have a field of reporters out there the way they did when I was a kid. Uh, if you were at the event and you caught the money quote and nobody else has it, you can consider selling it to them. And there's no established channel for that. You call up the program director, you call up the news director and say, I'm a graduate of York, I've got something here, you know, I can turn this around for you. Maybe give them the first one or two for free, get a meeting with them, you know, talk your way into these places. Try to be, you know, just try to be useful. I mean, you understand enough to understand what it is they're trying to do. I hope at these organizations, your internship should show you that if nothing else. The only thing I would add being, you know, 30 years old right now and having gone through my 20s is I've done a lot of different jobs in a number of different fields, most, mostly campaigns. Very few have I gotten without knowing someone who had a, some sort of connection with the, the employer to begin with. There's nothing that's better than having a reference prior to you actually applying for the job, whatever that application looks like, um, that is more helpful. Um, and a lot of it is the connections you make here in school where someone hears about some other job within the company or um, you know, something that's happening somewhere else. Uh, a lot of it's your peers. It doesn't have to necessarily be that person who gave you that internship that one summer or something like that. And be nice to people on the way up because you may need to call them on your way down. Absolutely. <laughs> there, there are a lot of, I've, I've noticed there's a lot of jobs out there. Do you guys, have, have you seen Gorkana.com? That's new to me, G-O-R-K-A-N-A dot com. And they list jobs that are available. There's way more than I ever would have thought. When people come into, people are coming into the New York market, and they're like hiring up like 10 and 15 reporters at a time. So even if you don't get that job, maybe somebody else is vacating a position somewhere else. So you should definitely stay, stay engaged. Wait, what's Wait, start at what's G-O-R-K-A-N-A. G-O-R. Hey, you see a lot of um, crossover uh, from journalists into going into something like your job or into politics. You don't see so much of that going back, especially the young and you know younger journalists. So there's some jobs building your resume that you probably shouldn't take, like keeping away from political campaigns if you yes. want to get a job. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think you gotta make a you know. It's usually a one-way trip. It's usually a one-way trip. I actually have gone back and forth. But, that, but that's kind of what you like prominent journalists who were who started off as working political and then went on to Yeah, but those were right, but those were unusual. I mean the it's only know, Chris Stephanopoulos. Yeah, well, there's well, Chris Matthews and Ron George Stephanopoulos. Well there's a Stephanopoulos. There's, but those are also kind of not you know, they're not using their they're not becoming street reporters after doing all their no, 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 big no, shot no, uh, no, their their personalities. Stuff. Right. So right. beyond building clips and also in making sure you choose jobs leading up to it that won't go against you. Right. I mean, you got to show an open mind and skill and ability to meet a deadline. I mean, there, you know, there's certain baseline skills that you need. You got to know how to tell a story, et cetera, et cetera. Accuracy. But you also have to be organized, and um, you know, and you're going to be. You got to be persistent. Sometimes you got to be obnoxious. Sometimes you got to be. You know, whatever it takes to get that story. You got to get that story by any means necessary. Yeah. Well, not by any means necessary. You gotta have some. You gotta have some ethical, ethical balance. Oh no, no! Can we have a round of applause?